Now there's a big but, and I'm, I'm going to drink something because I'm, my throat's a bit dry. There's a big but. It's natural gas. We are using, while we are also um, bringing solar and wind and renewables online, we are using a lot of natural gas. Uh, we are using it not just for our power plants, but for heating water, for space heating, and for industrial uses. The amount of natural gas we use for our heating and our industrial uses is actually more than what we use for electricity generation. And we use, we use two times the natural gas that we used in coal. So we think a lot about coal. There's been a beyond coal campaigns, and we think of dirty coal polluting our air, which they do because you see it in the air. It's quite dirty. But natural gas is a problem too. Natural gas produces about half the carbon dioxide of coal. But because we use two times the, as much car, uh, natural gas as coal, we produce as much carbon dioxide right now from natural gas as we do from coal. And then there's leaking, methane leaking. And the, the distribution systems for natural gas leak. The, uh, the thought is about by 2.3% right now. There's lower numbers and higher numbers, but that's kind of the, um, you know, a, a good number to kind of think of. Uh, with leaking, our natural gas use is actually more problematic and causing more greenhouse gases than our coal infrastructure right now. So we have to think of what, we have to bring our natural gas offline as well. The greenhouse, if we think, uh, we can look a little bit um, of what we can do to uh, tackle the natural, our natural gas use. And one of those things we can think of is, is where the greenhouse gases come from. Our commercial and residential, I think I can point over here, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions is about 11%. Uh, now that's not including the electricity we use in our commercial and, and, and residential sector. That's, that's um, our heating and our cooking and also some waste management, uh, waste issues as well. About 78% of the greenhouse gases in our commercial and residential sector come from natural gas and heating and cooking. So what that means is, is about 9% of the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions come from the residential and commercial sector with our, our heating and our cooking. But, but what that means is, is that we actually, uh, we as consumers, as a general person, we can actually do something about this. We can actually do something about the greenhouse gases that, um, that are being produced from natural gas, and we can have an impact. Just like with our cars, if you see 11% of the greenhouse gases come from cars, not from transportation. Transportation is about 30%, but from, from cars. And we can do something about that too, because we can buy electric vehicles. And so we can, what we can do about the heating and cooking is we can get electric heating and electric cooking. And electric heating with uh, heat pumps or you can, um, is one way we can do it in the, in the home. So a good way for us as consumers to have an impact on greenhouse gases is to move to the all electric home. And what that means is, is that you can do cooking, like induction cooking is very good. We use a lot of natural gas, and I know cooks love cooking with natural gas. My, my mother always cooked with natural gas and loves cooking. And I grew up cooking with natural gas as well. But to get natural gas out of, the, um, out of our energy infrastructure, we need to get it out of our homes too. And moving to in, uh, induction cooking is a really good way. I did get an induction oven myself. I do enjoy, enjoy cooking with it. It heats up really fast. And the other is to get heat pumps. And heat pumps are another great way. There, is, there are now cold climate heat pumps. There's air source and ground source heat pumps. And uh, they, they're a fabulous way. We can also just move to get solar panels on our roof, uh, get home management systems, and we can get energy storage as well and move to this all electric home. Here's, here's a heat pump. A heat pump is basically a, an air conditioner. Uh, it's basically an air conditioner running forward and backward. It can run backwards. And in the winter, you're going to take actually heat that is in the, even in cold air is outside, 
and you transfer it to the inside of your house. It's about 300% efficient, and they are using them in places like Maine. So it's not, it used to be something that they were used mainly in the south, but technology's improved. And you can use them as a, they, you can do water heating, you can do air conditioning, and you can do house heating. So the, um, the, the next thing I want to talk about is that we have to think of, our, of renewable energy as a resource. It is cleaner. It is cheaper. It is safer. And it is a resource. <coughs> it's not something that we have to do just because of climate change. It, it, we have to do it because of climate change. We have to do it fast. But it's, it's a, a wonderful resource, a health resource, of course. It, the um, air pollution has caused uh, from fossil fuels um, and biofuels and bioenergy and biomass burning is the less, le um, second leading cause of death worldwide. It's very, it's, it impacts our health very much, indoors and outdoors. We have air pollution indoors and outdoors from, fossil, from our fossil fuels. An MIT study in 2013 said that we would, uh, that it causes about 200,000 early deaths a year. We see heart disease and stroke and lower respiratory tract tract infection, lung cancers, asthma, and, and other illnesses that come from our fossil fuel infrastructure. It is, fossil fuels have an impact on the planet and they have an impact on humans. They are, they are poison. They poison us and they poison the planet. They, they contaminate the air and the water. You have coal that contaminates the air and water and, and contaminates streams from coal ash and um, um, that comes from the dust on the trains or from spills, of course. We have oil spills, um, natural gas, we have explosion, we have methane leaking, uh, nuclear energy, we have meltdowns, we have problems with storage. We have you know, events like Fukushima or Chernobyl, which have poisoned areas. So all of these things, can be removed, and we can move to a healthier future. We also have, they're also a national security resource. The former CIA chief, James uh, Wolfley, said, uh, has an interesting quote. He says, every time you fill up your car, you're sending a check to foreign countries to pay for their oil. Why not send money to the local utility, electric utility or your neighborhood solar installer instead? Indeed, if we move to renewable energy we're, and to, to powering our energy with electricity, that's what we're doing. We're sending money back to our local utility or to our neighborhood solar installer. It, it actually is a benefit um, instead of sending, having to guard our oil um, interests abroad and all of the money that we send abroad to transport, to move, and to guard our are the oil that's sent between here and there in Europe and wherever, we can be focusing on building our energy infrastructure here. It's, it's, it's um, estimated that about $75 billion per year is spent on the US national defense budget to secure our oil. There, it's a societal revenue resource like I was just talking about. We can, instead of spending money on the fossil fuel industry, much of, much of which is sent abroad, we can bring it towards developing our 21st century technology and the electricity industry. Uh, the grid moder modernization, just grid modernization, is thought to co will cost about $476 billion, but it's going to provide $2 trillion in benefit. That's what, what's thought. Um, and has what been, is what's been estimated. So this is, this is a definite, again, a resource. And we can think of it that way. We should be talking about it that way. It's also a US economy resource. The rest of the world is investing right now in 21st century technology. And we should be too. Now, I bring up China not to, um, in a very friendly, you know, um, competitive way, to say that China is investing heavily. They're actually the leaders in solar uh, implementation and manufacturing, in wind, and in electric vehicles. China was leading the EV production, and they sold 777,000 EVs in the year 2017. 
The U.S. sold about 200,000. So the U.S. is not um, investing as heavily in this 21st century technology as China is. And if, it, it, if, they're, um, if we want to, let's say, stay in the game and continue to be a nice, strong, healthy economy, we need to be investing in 21st century technology, not in coal. You know, we, we have to move from 20th century and, and 19th century technology. It is a resource for our cities and states as well. That, that is something to be, um, that's really, that is really um, something for us to think about where we've made a lot of headway. Uh, we, if cities and states develop their own power plants and they and have community solar as well, we can actually they can power their own energy, their own electricity, and that saves that can save quite a bit of money for the city in the long run. It also um, helps as far as resiliency. So if the city produces its own electricity, if there is a time that the main um, that the grid is down or something happens with the central generation, the city can continue to function. And if the if the city has an EV network, for instance, um, and they have their own city fleet and they have community solar on top of city hall or wherever, then the city can power its vehicle fleet with um, electricity it produces itself, or the vehicle fleets can be can be powered by the local electric utility. The other thing is uh, electric vehicles are powered for about a dollar per gallon equivalent. It's much, much less expensive to run electric vehicles on electricity or cars on electricity than it is to run it on oil. So this is a resource for our cities and towns, for sure. And they can create microgrids as, as well, the cities. Again, like I said, where you're resilient and that's where you think of the resilient uh, national security resource. And Puerto, Puerto Rico was not resilient. You know, they, they didn't have, um, after a storm, everything went down. And now they're working on becoming more resilient. Hawaii is working on it too. They have plans to become, um, to have 100% um, renewable electricity infrastructure. And, they are thinking about electric vehicles because they have to transport their oil to, um, um, to Hawaii. And it makes much more sense to make the electricity right there. But you don't have to be an island to benefit from that and from this renewable energy technology. You can do it in every city and make every city more resilient. And you can make it so that every city is its own microgrid. And even if you don't have... Um, 100% of the capacity that you would from the central generation. At least you can run some central functions. And as we know, we're becoming more and more and more reliant on electricity. When we don't have it, our phones don't work. It, our, our internet doesn't work. It's hard to get in touch with our loved ones. It's hard to call emergency if we don't have electricity. More and more of us are using um, smartphones and, and um, and so it's really, um, it's really important as we move to the 21st century to have this resilience. As I talked about, I'll talk a little bit more detail about EV networks uh, for cities and towns. 30% of US energy is used by transportation. And moving to electric vehicles um, is, is a really important resource for our cities, for fleets, and for people as well. It is, um, it's less expensive for all of us, it's less expensive for our cities, so it will help our cities, and it also controls the pollution in our cities uh, as well. We can also use our electric vehicles for managing our electricity. So we can actually, if, if we have our EVs and they're smart, we can actually charge them at times when the electricity is the cheapest and when we need to, so that we don't overload the grid or we don't all come home and plug our cars in at once and then charge them all at once. It's better if we charge them, let's say, when there's wind energy blowing at night when it's practically cheap. And ideally, our cars would be cheap 
I mean, our cars would be smart so that we could program in when we wanted our cars uh, charged, and we could we could do we could pro program it into a home management system, and then we could maybe pay less than a dollar per gallon equivalent, and the cities could too, and so that would benefit everybody. And we the other thing is is that we wouldn't be the electric vehicles are not um, because they're not on oil then they're not subject to the price fluctuations of the oil industry. As we know, whenever oil prices go up, it impacts our, our businesses because they start thinking about the shipping costs and then it gets, it gets trickles down to us and then we have to pay more money for the goods and services. And we talk about what a stress it is. If we have electric vehicles, then we are able to have a more consistent price on energy. The other thing is electricity is regulated. Electricity prices are regulated. We have regulators, and for good or bad, you know, people can get annoyed with the regulators, but the regulators are there to make sure our electric utilities, which are essentially monopolies, do not overcharge us for energy. And so they're there to make sure that the consumer is protected, that the homeowner is protected, that the business owner is protected, that we don't get that we don't get charged outrageous inflated prices for electricity. So if we get our energy from this electricity, if our cities get power their fleets of cars with electricity, then it is safer, it's better for all of us. So again, this is a resource. Again, as I mentioned, it's a consumer resource. But re moving to renewable energy in our home is a consumer resource in more ways because we can be and have our own microgrids in our homes, in our buildings. You know, it may be a building. I mean, especially in New York, um, you, you have many buildings, through <laughs> multi-family units throughout, throughout New York and throughout the, the world. But your building can be a microgrid. Buildings can have energy storage systems associated with them. So if the power goes out, at least some of the main functions in your building can function. And then if, if you have a home and you have energy storage in your home, that helps. You can also have it in a neighborhood. And, and the other thing is if you, if you have electric vehicles, if you have a garage in a multifamily unit, like an apartment building or whatever, or if you have, um, if you have a single family home, you can use your battery if there is the vehicle to home system. The battery on the car can actually power essential functions in your home. And it's very, it's very useful. And if you have solar panels on the roof, in a building or in uh, the house, in your house, you can actually um, produce some of your own electricity. And if, again, if there's a power outage, uh, a storm, or uh, God forbid, you know, a terrorist attack, then again, you can act as your own mini microgrid and, and power essential functions in your home. If you have enough, maybe you can power almost all of the functions in your home. So the other thing is with the electric vehicle, if you do have charging at home or in a garage, if you're in an apartment and you're, you have um, parking, uh, this is extremely convenient. I, right now I have an electric vehicle and I come home, I plug my car in or, you know, Maybe I don't if I'm nice and I plug at night when the, when the wind is blowing. And, uh, um, and it's so convenient. I don't like going to the gas station at all anymore. I mean, you can, it, you can go to fast chargers and, and get the charged, uh, car charged, but it's really wonderful to be able to plug in. And ideally, you know, eventually anywhere on the street you can access electricity. I had seen pictures in London. I haven't seen it uh, personally, but they had, were putting plugs in lampposts. People were pull, you know, pulling up to the lamppost and just plugging their car, cars in. I mean, they had provided um, plugs there so that you can charge. So this is something you can do anyway. It's really convenient. Electric vehicles are always, also really, really fun. They have amazing acceleration and torque, and you can beat anybody. You know, I mean, you can just drive and nobody can catch you. And so, <laughs> you know, you just, you know, if you, you, can, if you want to pass that guy there and get in front of him, they don't know what's happened to them. You go so you have so much acceleration. You just kind of look at them, and then you can get in front before they can even think think twice about pulling up to not letting you in. But you know, I mean, that's sort of the fun part. And I'm not really a car person. I was I wasn't like reading about cars and following cars. But when I experienced electric vehicle, I thought, wow, 
you know, this, this is the future and this is fun. And I know so many people will have fun with this cars, especially, especially uh, car enthusiasts. So when we think of renewable energy, we really, really, really should be thinking about it as an amazing, amazing renewable energy resource. There's health benefits, um, there's revenue that we bring to our cities and our towns and to our country. We have backup storage and microgrids. It's awesome, fun, and convenient. It really is. It, it, you get energy independence. Uh, it's good for the environment. You have resilience. Um, it's the future of technology. It is cheaper. It is safer. And, and it will help the climate. Right? I mean, we're thinking of renewable energy because of helping uh, because of climate change. And really, climate, I don't want to downplay it. It is probably the biggest threat to society today. Okay? Climate is a huge deal. It's so important. But that's what we always talk about. And half of this country you know, doesn't listen when you talk about climate. Part of this country doesn't even believe climate's an issue, right? <laughs> which is another problem. But, but the truth is, it's a resource, it's fun, it's awesome. We should be moving there anyway. Other countries in this world are moving there. So we should too, we really should. And um, that's a wonderful way to think about it. And it can be fun, I repeat, you know, for, for any of us, uh, 21st century technology can be fun. It is sometimes scary, Auto autonomous driving, you know, <laughs> Maybe it's a neat idea to have a car come to your house and pick you up and nobody's there and it's pretty cool. But, you know, I'm a kid born in the 20th century and, and moving to new technology is always hard. At the last turn of the century, people were afraid of electricity. You know, they were not sure about what this new technology would bring to them. And indeed, none of us can be sure. We have a lot of new technologies coming online. But, but renewable energy is coming and, it, and we have to think of it for all of the positive things and the resources it provides. So now we have to think, how do we make it happen? Now we have to make it happen faster and sooner because of climate change. I, I think it's happening anyway, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but we do need to have, have it happen quickly, ideally in the next 15 years, which wow, but definitely by the year 2050, we should be, we should have, um, we should be at pretty close to zero, we should be at zero emissions by that time. So country and state and city and town initiatives, community initiatives are a big way and to make this transformation happen. In the United States, we are a civilized society and we're governed by the rule of law. And using the rule of law to make to better society is something we should we should do. We, um, you know, passing laws does not make us socialist. You know, we pass laws all the time, and I hear all the time that well, we should you know we don't want to pass a law to make one technology win over another, and we're so focused on having the market decide on everything today. I don't know if we, but as a society, we think in that way, but. Because I, I don't know if we're afraid, it, it, it's as though we're afraid of being called socialists or what it is, we think the market should just govern everything. But the market has not decided on really important decisions for us in, in the history of this country. In, in, the 19, in 1950, we invested in the highway infrastructure. Uh, in 1960, we allocated resources to go to the moon. No, we did not have the market decide that we wanted to go to the moon. We decided that we wanted to go to the moon because we wanted to in, invest in new technology, expand our horizons as human, human, uh, humans, as a society. In World War II, we decided to fight terrorism and, um, sorry, fascism. And we made a decision, the market didn't decide Hitler is in Germany and we need to go fight him, right? We decided this guy's really dangerous. We need to go and get rid of him from Europe because this is this is terrible. And civil rights laws were also um, decided by 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 um, turned into laws. Um, we expanded the right to vote, and we even passed immigration laws. So we pass laws, and we can pass laws and 
have in, um, have legal initiatives in our society to better society. And climate change is a threat. There's no reason not to pass laws to remove move to renewable energy and take fossil fuels offline if climate change is a threat to our society. We do other things. We have cafe standards where we have fuel economy standards where we decide how many miles per gallon our cars should get. The Department of Energy invests in future technologies, which we need to do as a country because we can't stay in the 20th century. The rest of the world is moving to the 21st century. So we do things like we invested in Tesla. We put, uh, and Tesla actually repaid the $465 million loan that the Department of Energy gave to them. Uh, China has also invested in their electric vehicle charging company, which is BYD. They, they uh, have given them about $590 million in grants and subsidies. subsidies. And I'm not sure if they've given more even now. But what do you see here? With Tesla, um, there is all of this doubt about Tesla. Every day there's an article about how Tesla is going to fail. But they released the Model 3. And in August of 2018, this last summer, the Model 3 was the best-selling car in August. And actually, it's been either one of the top or one of the best-selling cars for the second half of 2018. So it's really been um, a successful product. And, and China, Sweden, Norway, uh, Netherlands, India, France, and some other countries are planning to ban internal combustion engine cars in the future. Because they don't have oil. We have oil. And we have this auto industry and this oil industry, so we're not banning as quickly. It doesn't serve other countries that have to fill up for $6 per gallon to have fossil fuel-fueled cars. For them, it makes sense to move to electric vehicles, and we have the technology now. So they're doing it. If the rest of the world is doing it, who are we going to sell our gas-powered, you know, oil-powered cars to in the world? Who is Ford or General Motors going to do it? We already. You know, Detroit's already suffering as it is. We need our auto industry to be strong because we need people to work. We need our industries. So it, it's important that we invest in future technology. We have legisl legislative initiatives that have been important for renewable energy. We have the renewable portfolio standards, and that is laws that, <clears throat> that, we, that guide or tell utilities how many how much renewable um, energy or what percentage of renewable energy they need to have as part of their um, uh, part of their generation. And different states have different amounts. But it's been very successful. About half of the United States renewable energy uh, capacity has been grown from laws um, that have been passed for um, renewable portfolio standards. And then we've also had tax credits. There's bipartisan budget act, uh, acts that have been passed. There was the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. And that was for tax credits for, um, for renewable electricity. We also have tax credits for electric vehicles. And one of the reasons it's bipartisan is that wind is very productive in Republican-led states. Kansas, Oklahoma, Wyoming, Texas, all of these places have a lot of wind. And it helps farmers. Because when farmers don't have enough produce, they can still generate electricity. There is some value. There's quite a bit of value. And those, Iowa as well, and those states do want renewable energy. It's a resource for them. You know, they, and, and that's why I think you're seeing these uh, laws passed and these budgets passed. That 100% um, Counties, states, and town and uh, initiatives have also started to pop up, and they're very important. There are communities that say we want 100% renewable energy, and there are states that are talking about it as well, and that has been uh, very useful. In Hawaii, the governor of Hawaii passed a law; um, was the first state to to um, pass law for 100% renewable electricity by the year 2045. New Jersey has a law for 100% clean electricity in 2050. Um, California has a, a, a law for a goal of 100% clean electricity by 2045. In New York and Washington, um, Governor Cuomo and Inslee are also pushing for clean electricity laws as well. 
And, and it's really powerful. We won't necessarily do it. <clears throat> if what we're not doing as a nation, we can start thinking of the resource and the benefit that it has for us in our towns, our cities, or our states. And, and that helps because that um, helps develop the technology. It helps develop the know-how. And, and we can do it that way. And also, 90 cities and towns and 10 counties have, uh, have made commitments to be 100% renewable energy. And they're not all Democrat, Democratic or left-leaning. You see a lot of cities and towns that are in red states and red city and towns. Uh, Greensburg, Kansas, Rockport, Missouri, Salt Lake City, Utah, um, San Diego, California, that has strong uh, conservative right-leaning populations are moving to renewable energy as well because it's a resource. Because these, many of the mayors and the leaders there have said, you know, it's a resource. We can make our own electricity. It's better for us. It makes us resilient. We're just, we're going to do it. Uh, I heard the mayor in um, Georgetown, Texas talking and he was talking about the wind, all of the wind energy around his town and how it just made sense for their town to, to do it. And then Portland, Oregon has done it. Of course, that is a left-leaning town um, with t um, Mayor Ted Wheeler. And they have a uh, past, uh, have, have enacted a goal where they'll be 100% renewable by the year 2050. Uh, they'll have, uh, renewable electricity earlier, and then eventually all of their transportation and heating and all of their city uses will be 100%. Some of these goals are for 100% electricity, not for everything, not for all of our needs. That is one thing that we need to keep in mind when we think of, oh great, you know, this Hawaii has decided to become a 100% renewable state. It is wonderful, but it's not, it isn't a law for everything, but it's a great start. It's a good. It's good that we're doing it. That our cities and states are doing it. There is some question about how we fund this transformation. We do need to think about that. It's hard. Uh, we need city financing. We private industry does invest in this, of course. Green banks and loan guarantees are very helpful. Um, there are incentives. There's um, various financing like PACE. Uh, utilities can help as well. I'll talk about that a little bit, but because utilities are the ones providing the fuel for this, it would be great to have our utilities be more involved in actually helping uh, push this transformation. They're the ones who have the customers, they're in contact with us, and they can be really big, really important players. Not just give us electricity, but actually help with this transformation. So now I go back, now I do go to the utility. And another way we can make this happen is with our electric utility. There was a time our electric utilities were marketing their product. In the early, oops, let's see how we're doing. In the early 20th century, in 2030, I mean not 20th century, in 1930, sorry, uh, you had this little guy, Ready Kilowatt, and they, the utilities were trying to push electricity, trying to get homes electrified, or trying to bring electri um, electricity throughout the United States. And they, they used him as a marketing tool um, to um, push their product. And, and then eventually in 1950, you had the all-electric home, and you had Westinghouse, GE, and Whirlpool partnered with uh, 300 utilities, I believe, to push the all-electric home. So in some sense, we're reviving the concept of the all-electric medallion home. And amazingly, Ronald Reagan was the spokesman for, and he, the spokesman for the all-electric home, and he would talk about how we can live better electrically. And, um, and the, these, guys, um, these guys talked about how you can live electrically. They partnered with private industry, and they tried to develop our, the electrification of the rural communities as, all, as well. And utility, so the utilities were players in doing it, and they could be players again. My co-author, David Freeman, was a CEO of utilities um, for years. He's 93 now. And <clears throat> he headed Tennessee Valley Authority Sacramento Municipal, Dis, um, Municipal Utility Distri uh, District, and he headed um, 
LADWP in Los Angeles as well. And he had heat pump programs in, in Tennessee Valley Authority. And, he's, and he always pushed um, energy efficiency. And the all-electric home was what he talked about. And he was saying, we as, as utilities, or the utilities, can actually help save society. They can actually help make a cleaner future for us. And he tried to do it when he was actually running utilities. And now he's, uh, we wrote a book together, and he, that's one of the things that we really wanted to bring home, was that the folks that are supplying the fuel can actually be important players. There's a few utilities that are uh, doing it. Two really notable ones are Green Mountain Power of Vermont and Sacramento Municipal Utility District, SMUD is their name. And they're promoting the all-electric home. Many utilities are not, not doing it. Now they're starting to promote electric vehicles, and they are supporting electrification, but they are not <coughs> pushing the all-electric home, per se. But Green Mountain Power is, and, and SMUD is as well. Green Mountain Power is a utility to look at, because they're doing what we need in society. They're, they're doing really cool stuff. They're actually, they have um, folks who come in. Dave Freeman, my co-author, talks about we need green doctors. Every utility needs a green doctor. And they basically have that. I don't know if they call them green doctors. That, that's what Dave calls them. But um, we need, um, what, what they do, what Green Mountain Power does, is they bring somebody to their customer's home. They look at the house. They um, do an energy audit. They help them, then they find contractors for them. They have a, a bunch of contractors that can actually do this work and that they know can do their work. And, and then, so basically they help facilitate making an all electric, renewable, clean home is what the utility does. So they come in, they look at it, they bring the contractors, they can put solar panels on your roof, they can put heat pumps in your home, they can, um, um, Get, I think they had, a, they had a Tesla Powerwall program where they were bringing Tesla Powerwall energy storage batteries in. They have some uh, work with uh, electric vehicles also. They even have some of their homes get off the grid because it's more beneficial for them to have some of these homes actually get off the grid. So they do all of this, and then they help you wrap all of the, the price of everything, all of the upgrades you've made to your home into the electric bill. And then they also finance it for you, because financing is huge. I mean, to be able to do these transformations in our homes, in our, in, in, in our own spaces, it can be hard because of financing. My parents got a, a heat pump when their natural gas furnace um, got too old and broke, and they needed a new one. I said, all right, now it's time to get a heat pump. Let's do it. This is awesome. So I sent my dad, go, all right, I think I found a contractor. Go talk to this guy. Um, and there's this type of cold climate, and we're in Portland, Oregon, it's not that cold there, so we didn't need the coldest, cold, you know, um, cold climate heat pump. We didn't need a total, the one that you would need for Maine or something, right? But um, I said, go get it. And I said, I think this one and this heat pump are good. I've read about them. I, I wrote a book about it. So my dad goes back and he's like, uh, you know, how am I going to pay for this? So it was about $12,000, right? And, and it, their, their air conditioner broke also. So they thought, OK, we can get this thing, and for the, it can do our air conditioning and our heating, and it'll save us price and utility bills, because it's 300% efficient as well, these things, as they transfer heat from either the ground or the air. So, so um, but he said, I can't, I can't buy it right now. So then he started looking, and eventually he found a, a a heat pump, a cold climate heat pump that had 0% financing and over four years or something like this, and that's the one he got. In the end, the heat pump he got was the one that had financing. So financing is really important. What Green Mountain Power does is Green Mountain Power provides the financing. It wraps it into your electricity bill, and now you've upgraded your home. It's energy efficient, so it uses less energy, which is good for the utility, because now they don't have to build more plants because your home is using less electricity. Maybe you even have solar panels on your roof. And they're financing it. 
and they're engaged with their customer. They're great, and utilities want to have nice relationships with their customers. You know, we may not realize it, but they spend an enormous amount of time thinking about us, their customer. They really want us to like them. Maybe we don't <laughs> often, but they really, you know, for them it's really bad. Reliability is important, and then having their customer like them and be happy and uh, is important to them all as well. So Green Mountain Power has a lot. They're really good to look at. SMUD is also doing it as well. That's another utility to look at. If anybody is interested in knowing more about that, those are the, the folks um, I would go to to think about the model, model utilities, you know, how it can be. So of course, advocacy is important, right? We, we have to advocate as well. To make this transformation happen, advocacy has been essential. You know, we have the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, where people have gone and protested, and um, that has, that's been important. It's gotten a lot of press. We have the People's Climate March. We have various campaigns and non-government organizations. 350.org has pushed to tell us about how many parts per million you know, um, carbon uh, we should have in the air. That th that's 350 parts per million is what we should, should have. We've gone over that now. Um, Clean, moving beyond coal, there was a beyond coal campaign that brought our, a lot of attention to the fact that we need to move beyond coal, that there are other technologies there, and it's been very successful. And then the keep it in the ground campaign is another campaign. I bring this up because you have Bernie Sanders here and Jeff Merkley here, um, the uh, senators from Vermont and in Oregon, and Bill McKibben here, I don't know where he is, right there. You know who I who was part of this campaign. The campaign got the attention of our lawmakers. That's what we want. And eventually, our lawmakers either pass laws if they can, or they push, you know, push for this. And it's important. So our work, our our grassroots work, is important because it is heard. It might feel exhausting and tiring, or that nobody hears us, but they do. You know, it happens. You can see it right here that, you know, the, the, we have our lawmakers and have heard them. So, I wonder if I missed something. Oh, I think I missed something. Okay, that's why. I was thinking about the Green New Deal. I did want to talk about the Green New Deal. And the Green New Deal is um, another example of, the, of um, work that has involved advocacy and, and our lawmakers. Right now you have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who, who um, is pushing the Green New Deal, which is looking to create a committee to move, that will evaluate um, renewable energy and our, our um, our energy future and get lawmakers to, together to um, create a law, create laws and goals for, for our future to get us off of fossil fuels in time. And that work, the, the New Deal, Green New Deal, has been based on um, a lot of work by previous lawmakers and also uh, folks who have done a lot of advocacy work over the year have helped, helped give knowledge to our lawmakers so that they can um, do something like the Green New Deal. And, and you have Bernie Sanders, Jeff Merkley, uh, various other senators, and law, there's a whole bunch of others that are supporting the Green New Deal. And the other interesting thing with the Green New Deal is that um, uh, I think one of the requir requirements on the committee is anybody who is on the committee, the, the, what I think has been proposed is anybody who's on the committee should not be getting money uh, from any of the lawmakers, shouldn't be getting money from the oil industry. Because there's a thought that they can't be objective if they're actually getting money from the oil industries or the fossil fuel industries. Because it is normal, um, they're not, the fossil fuel industries don't, we are, we do have a market-based economy and they're an industry and they don't want to see their industry go. I mean, there are a lot of people whose jobs are on the line from this industry. It is some, it is, it, doing the transformation is hard. I mean, we see the coal miners 
and they tell their stories. And, and the transformation is hard. I mean, I'm, I was born in Detroit. I have family in Detroit. I've seen what happens when industry is not healthy in a community. I don't know if anybody has been there, but Detroit is a, was hit very, very hard. And, it, in, and the, much of the city collapsed. It was you know, very hard on that. I don't wish that on any community. And so the Green New Deal is looking at doing a just transition as well, so that any communities that are um, um, heavily reliant on um, working with um, fossil, having workers that work on fossil fuel or employed by fossil fuels are getting priority to be able to retra be retrained and move into the new 21st century clean technology economy. And also our poorer communities and, and so that we can actually uplift our society as we move forward and have it be a resource, this transformation. Okay, so the other driver, of course, is technological innovation, entrepreneurial spirit, and that all leads to dropping prices. And it leads, ultimately, when you have technological innovation, that leads to disruption. And we've seen, we've seen uh, energy transformations in the past, the last turn of the century, we had disruption. Folks were driving around in horse and buggies and on horses. Um, in the early 1900s, by 1913, 1920, there were cars everywhere after you saw mass production. The transformation can happen really fast. You know, the, um, we had airplanes in the air by World War I, and, and electricity also hit, hit um, hit fast as well. So um, the reason that those technologies took hold is because they provided something for society. They were, they were, um, had be they were better product than riding around in a horse and buggy, even though horses are um, great also. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, it's, it's just it was something that folks needed, or not needed, but enjoyed using, and it was, a, it was valuable to them, and you saw that it happened fast. And now we're seeing here, too, um, these te technological transformations happening in our time and happening quickly as well. 